Section 2.4, Continuity. This is from OpenStax Calculus, Volume 1. There's a link at the bottom of your page. In fact, there's one at the top of this one um, telling, showing you where you can go to get the entire textbook free. I would suggest you do that. These notes are intended, these videos are intended to go along with the textbook, so they go very well together. Okay, so to begin with, in this section of continuity, what makes a function not continuous? That's really the big question. What makes a function not continuous? Now, the layman definition, the anybody but a mathematician definition, the one that'll work every day, is that it, the something that does not break, okay? Or in mathematics, you can draw it without picking your pencil up. But I want you to take a second, pause the video, and think about for a second what it means to be not continuous. Come up with some examples of things that aren't continuous. Okay, so now that you've restarted and had a chance to think about that, what sort of things did you come up with? I have four or three examples here of functions that are not continuous um, and some statements that kind of go along with those. So possibly one of the examples you came up with was something that has a hole in it. It's a function where we have a hole in it. Okay, like this right here, where the function is not defined. Okay, that's one thing you could have come up with. Another example you could have come up with is one that has a break in it. Okay, it has an obvious break in it at some point. And then there's always the chance that you just had a hole and, you know, had something like that. Those are three possible things you could have come up with. So the question is, can we conclude something about these statements? Um, this first one, this would be where f of a is not defined. Okay, that would be a, that would be a discontinuity because the function is not defined. Uh, the second is the limit. If we appeal to the limit, the limit as x approaches, that does not say anything there, as x approaches a does not exist in that graph. Okay, so one thing we have in terms of the limit definition here is that the limit has to exist. And then just because the limit exists, so for instance here, the limit exists, but the function is not at that point. Okay. So this actually gives us our definition of continuous at a point. A function is continuous at a point, A, if and only if f of A is defined, so we have to have a value there, the limit as you approach A of f of x must exist, and the limit must equal the value of the function at that point. If any of these fail, if any of these are not true, then our function is discontinuous at that point. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. Determine whether each function is continuous at the given point. So we must consider three things. First, is it defined at, in this case, x equals 2? Does the limit from the left, the limit from the right, are those the same? And do all three of those agree? Okay, so let's first check out f of 2. If I evaluate that function at 2, I get 0 over 0. So this is undefined. Which, by our conditions up there, 1 is violated, it is discontinuous. Alright, so it is dis discontinuous at x equals 2. For that reason. Now, if we carried on and took the limit, the limit as you approach 2 from beneath, well, this actually equals, if we factor this out, x plus 2. So the limit coming from the left is 4, which is the same as the limit as you approach 2 from the right. And so the limit exists, however, because the function is, does not exist, that does not work. Okay, But that's just kind of worth noting. So if the function is defined, we might continue moving on. Okay, so part B, first, is f of 3, is f of 3 defined? Well, x equals 3 would appeal to this part of our piecewise function, so let's plug 3 in there because it is a quadratic. We can do that. That would be negative 9 plus 4, so that's negative 5. f of 3 is negative 5. Okay, so it's, it's defined there. It is defined there. The question is, 
does the limit exist? All right, so the limit as x approaches 3 from beneath of f of x, that would appeal to that first function, so that limit is negative 5. Limit as x approaches 3 from above, from above, that would appeal to the denominator, the, the, the second function, the second part of our piecewise function. Evaluating that at 3, because it is linear, that will be 4. All right, so the function exists, the limit as a whole does not exist because those two are different. So part two is violated and this function is discontinuous. Discontinuous at x equals three. Okay, part C, we've actually looked at this function previously and we determined a couple of things. Well, mainly the limit. So let's look at that in a second. But if I evaluate this at 0, well, that tells me I need to use this. So f of 0 is 1. All right. Now, the limit as of x approaches 0 of f of x, as we approach 0, is actually going to involve the upper function. We're not at 0. We are getting close to 0. And we looked at this quite a bit. That limit is 1 from the left and the right is 1. So this is actually a continuous function. It's continuous at x equals 0 because of that second definition of the piecewise function. Okay, now we could go back and prove this statement. We are not going to do that. Polynomials, rational, and trigonometric functions are continuous at every point in their domains. Okay. We stated this previously. I can prove it. It is provable. However, we're not going to do that. Um, but in the textbook, I believe they walk through that. So that is worth looking at just to see a rigorous, a rigorous proof of continuity. All right, so when it comes down to it, there are three types of discontinuities. Three types, three ways these can go wrong. Okay, the first is called a removable discontinuity. I think of this as I could literally, I could plug it, okay, it's like a hole in a wall, okay, I can plug it, I can put putty in it, um, so it is removable because I could fix that, I could just take that one point and move it, all right, the second type is a jump discontinuity, which is exactly what it looks like, it jumps, okay, the function is, this, this is where the limits do not agree, and that's where the limits do not agree, but the function does exist, all right. And the last we have the an infinite discontinuity, meaning we have an asymptote that's happening there. Okay, there's no way I can bring those two back together because they are infinitely in the opposite directions. Okay, so if I were to go back to my previous, my previous um, number 17, not number 17. What is it? Number one. There we go. The first is a discontinuity, but it is a it is a removable discontinuity because the limits exist, they agree, but the function is not defined there. Okay, so that is a removable discontinuity. We could just plug the hole there. All right, the second kind is a jump discontinuity because the limits do not agree coming from the left and the right. Okay, and the last one, well, that was a con, that was continuous, so nothing to talk about there. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples. I've actually got the answers written to the side. Um, you know what? These are the same functions, aren't they? The first two are. All right, so the first one, the limits exist. Now, you can look back at number one for those things we wrote there. The limit exists, but the function does not, so that tells us it is removable. And this is a way to determine which of these. If the limit does not exist, but the function does, then that is a jump. That means we are coming from the left, coming from the right. They don't agree. We've got something like, something like this, a jump. The limit does not exist, but the function does at that point right there. And the last kind is an infinite because this at negative one we have an asymptote. There's no tricks we can pull. We just the function doesn't exist and the fun and the limit doesn't exist either. Okay, so that is a way we want to make sure we can classify these different things into these different types. Alright, the last thing that we are going to discuss in this section is the intermediate value theorem. Now this is a very important idea. 
that comes up quite a bit. So the idea of something being continuous is there are intuitively no breaks. So what this says is if we have a continuous function over a closed bounded interval, if z is any real number between f of a and f of b, then there's a number c such that f of c equals z. Okay. So what that means is that if we have we our function exists in this region. Okay, it is a closed bounded region between a and b. That if there's a point in between there somewhere, there's an x if there's a y value between those two, those endpoints, then there's an x value that matches up with it. Effectively, the function gets everywhere in that interval. There's no there's no jumps, there's no skips. It reaches, it attains a value at every at every x value and every y value in that region. Okay? So the most common use of this, the most common use of this theorem is to determine zeros or solutions. So show that f of x equals x minus cosine x has at least one zero. Okay. So what this turns out to what we need is we need to find a point where the function is less than zero and a point where it's greater than zero. The idea being that if it's negative at some point and it's positive at some point, if it's continuous, there has to be a zero in between there. So to begin with, we first want to notice that this is continuous. Okay, it's a composition or it's a sum of a polynomial and a trigonometric function. Okay, so this is continuous. So this is continuous on the entire real line. Okay, that is worth knowing. First, we want to say it's and it's this as over a closed bounded interval. So why don't we just consider, why don't we just consider that it is continuous on zero to one? Uh, a more natural domain. How about we use zero to pi? Let's just go ahead and say it is continuous on zero to pi. Okay. Well, let's see what happens at those endpoints. Okay. F of zero, f of zero is negative one. Zero minus one, okay, so negative one there, which is less than zero. All right, the function is negative at some point. What about f of pi? We know great things happen with trigonometric functions and pi. So if we evaluate that pi, that is pi, and at pi that is plus one, or it's negative one, so pi plus one. So it's less than zero at some point, it's greater than zero at some point, so therefore, all right, f of c equals zero for some c in that interval zero to pi. That is, the function is negative in that interval zero to pi. It's positive in that interval zero to pi. So it has to be zero somewhere in that in that interval. Now we don't know what the x value is. We could solve for it in the next um, few chapters. We will learn how to do that very well. But we don't know what the value is, but we can say there is some value. All right, in example four, if f of x is continuous over zero to two, f of zero is greater than zero, and f of two is greater than zero, can we conclude that it has no zeros in that interval? Well, if we look at the intermediate value theorem, that's this function's continuous over a closed bounded interval. All we can say is that there is a value in between 0 and 2 that is positive. We can't actually say that it's, there's a 0. So the answer really there is no. Okay. The intermediate value theorem does not apply in this case. Okay. Because all we know is the function is positive at two different points. We don't know that it never dips down. Um, again, in our chapter on derivatives, we will learn some neat tricks to determine that. All right, for f of x equals 1 over x, f of negative 1 equals negative 1, so that's less than 0, and f of 1 equals 1, and that's greater than 0. Can we conclude that it has a 0 in that interval? Well, if you read the hypotheses, let f be, a conti be continuous over a closed bounded interval. Well, negative 1 to 1 is closed and bounded. However, it, this function is not continuous. All right, we cannot say that, so no, because f of x equals 1 over x is not continuous. 
at x equals 0. And that is not irremovable. It's an infinite discontinuity. Okay, so, but it is not continuous. That's all we need to know there. All right. Is that the last one? Nope, we have one more. Show that f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus 3x plus 1 has a 0 in 0 to 1. Okay, so first, this is a polynomial. This is continuous on that interval 0 to 1. That is worth noting. It's a closed bounded interval. Okay, It's a polynomial, so it's continuous. So let's see what happens at f of 0. If we evaluate that at 0, that is going to be positive 1. That is greater than 0. Let's see what happens at f of 1. That is 1 minus 1 minus 3. 0, negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. So it's less than 0 at some point. It's greater than 0 at some point. Therefore, f of c equals 0 for some c in that interval. You know that at some point, because it's positive at some point, negative at some point, it must be 0 at some point in there. Okay, and I believe that brings us to the end of this section over continuity. Make sure that you look back at the textbook and see that some of those really rigorous definitions of continuity um, and make sure you can classify between these different types. All right, that is 2.4 continuity.